with Rehit and the Carol bike, and this has been shown in numerous studies and we see it in our data, you get a substantial improvement in VO2 max. So you get around 12% in just eight weeks. So let's start. What exactly is a Caro bike and why aren't I riding one right now? <laughs> That's all right. So Caro bike is the smartest and most effective exercise bike. It's been scientifically proven to give you double the health and fitness benefits in 90% less time compared to regular steady state cardio. Um, it's got simple and AI personalized workouts that are suitable for pretty much any age and fitness levels. And workouts can be done in five minutes. And the, the best part is you only have to work hard for two 20 second sprints. So it's short, effective, and very easy to fit into your life. You're absolutely right about that. Now, everybody knows there are plenty of exercise bikes out there already. And certainly people heard about what happened during COVID with a particular exercise bike company. What gap did you see in the market that led to the creation of the Carol bike? Before I, I'm not an insider in the fitness industry. Um, I worked in automotive industry and a lot in healthcare, actually. I'm a mechanical engineer by background. And um, in healthcare, we designed with my co-founders um, chronic disease management programs for people with heart failure, diabetes, and so on. Um, and exercise is simply the most powerful intervention for well, not only that patient population, for everybody really, but nevertheless, for those people particularly. And um, we, we couldn't get them to exercise. And when we looked at the science, uh, if you survey people why they don't exercise, the number one reason stated is lack of time. Now, Surely, for some, it might be an excuse, but uh, we believe that the competition for time is really intense and that there is a, a need for time-efficient exercise. And when we came across the science of rehit, reduced exertion high-intensity training, we, we fell in love basically overnight and, and really wanted to do that, wanted our patients to um, be able to do that. But you couldn't replicate the science that um, university researchers discovered in the lab on a normal exercise bike. So they used special equipment. And simply there was no, there was no suitable equipment available. Um, and that seemed such a, such a huge gap to us that we felt why not try and close that gap. And that's now, this is almost 10 years ago. And an awful lot of development effort has gone into that. But by now, we have a very nice product that makes Rehit very simple and, uh, dare I say, easy for people to do in their own home, in gyms. And so that's, that's what uh, motivated us. Gotcha. You know, I, I talk and write a lot about exercise snacking and why you, why you don't need to go to the gym for hours a day to get the benefits of, of exercise. And you're absolutely right. Um, my patients basically say they, they don't have the time. Uh, and certainly during COVID, no, nobody had the ability uh, mm -hmm. to go to the gym. So I want to really, you know, dive into to what rehit is versus hit, because I think a lot of people listening understand high intensity interval training hit. But take us through that um, and, and why that's so important. Sure, sure. So mo most people will be familiar with HIT, high intensity interval training. And a typical HIT program would last 20, 30 minutes, um, have multiple like higher intensity intervals, four, five, six, seven, eight. And they vary in range from 40 seconds to four minutes. There's a great variety. And while the benefits are beyond doubt. It is actually quite difficult for most people to um, perform those hit sessions because the rate of perceived exertion 
is fairly high. And it's also not that time efficient once you the, the prep and shower afterwards and everything. Um, so based on that, Rehit was developed by scientists who were looking for the shortest, most effective, most accessible way to exercise. And research has proven that Rehit is simply the fastest way to get fit. And a Rehit session consists basically only of two 20-second sprints with a very light warm-up, recovery, and cool-down period. And so where, where HIT offers high-intensity training, ReHIT offers maximum intensity. So you really push to your limits, but you do it only for a very brief, very short period of time, which makes it which makes the total exertion much, much lower. You know, uh, you know when, I, when I first tried your bike, and, you know, it, maybe we can talk through this, but you basically kind of have a warm-up period of, of, of two minutes. And, you know, I'm going, well, okay, come on, let's get this going, because I'm following the directions from the bike, obviously. And I'm going, well, this is silly. Uh, what am I doing this for? And then it goes, all right, you know, now you're going to do mm. this for 20 seconds. You're going to pump as hard as you can. Go. And, okay, you do that. And then I'm going, okay, now, you know, this is when we're really going to start. And then it says, okay, uh, you're done and relax and let's slow down and cool down for two minutes. And I'm going, well, this is silly. And, and uh then we do it again for 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. I hope I'm saying this right. Uh, yeah. and, and then you were, we do one more cool down, and it says, you know, congratulations, you're done. And I'm going, oh, oh come on. I, I didn't even break a sweat. And Dave Asprey, you know, used to talk about this. He said, how would you like to get fit without breaking a sweat in five minutes? Mm -hmm. I'm like, come on. So, yes, I, did I work hard for 20 seconds two times in a row? Yeah, but it was not. I didn't want to throw up, uh, <laughs> as mm -hmm. some hit training can do. Yeah. So t teach me the science of why that mm. my perceived exertion wasn't very high, and yet I got a benefit. Sure, sure. So um, the I, I want to just two two things. So it is actually true. the The level of energy you burn during the sprints is so low that most people don't even break a sweat. Uh, now, I we don't want to say everybody because, you know, some people are naturally sure. uh, have a greater tendency to sweat and they do. Um, but most people actually don't sweat. And uh, I, I know that some of our female users, many of our female users actually really appreciate that they can get a good workout in at least without having to have their hair done and um, all, all again and, and need to go to the hairdresser again. So uh, <laughs> that, that is true. It doesn't apply to everybody, but um, most people can do it without even breaking a sweat. But let's, let's um, it, it is still like these two 20 second sprints, if you um, push to your limit, those two 20 second sprints um, are hard. So it's, it's I don't wanna say it's, like, it's not a fitness pill or a free lunch. You do have to work hard for those two 20 second uh, sprints and your heart rate will be elevated and so on. Now, wh why does it get you fit? The uh, secret lies in the rapid onset of the high intensity. So you go from your base rate um, very rapidly in the sprints to create a huge spike in energy demand. So um, your energy demand increases by a factor of 100. And uh, that energy demand can't be met with your normal aerobic um, energy system. So where you take sugar, fat from your bloodstream. Instead, your muscles have to burn um, and have to utilize locally stored energy uh, resources. And that's first for the first 10 seconds of the sprint or so, that's phosphocreatine. That switches on fastest, is immediately available, but it only lasts for about 10 seconds. Uh, and then you're forced to you force your muscles to anaerobically burn muscular glycogen. And um, what that uh, triggers is, um, or what that means is that you're tapping into your, what we call emergency energy reserves. 
So you, you have those glycogen stores in reserve for situations where you have to run for your life or fight for your life. And with those uh, rehit sprints, you can you force your body to mobilize um, a fairly large amount of your muscular glycogen stored in your thighs, about 25 to 30 percent. And now that triggers uh, a cascade. Uh, certain signaling molecules get released. So that's uh, initially AMPK, which is bound to the glycogen and gets then released and activated. Um, and then further downstream, it um, releases and activates PGC1-alpha, which is another signaling molecule that, um, that is the master regulator for mitochondrial biogenesis. So with those sprints, you set in place, you set off a cascade of um, physiological responses that um, in effect tell your body that it has to get fitter and stronger and increase the the um, mitochondrial volume and and uh, numbers so that you're getting better at utilizing oxygen and that increases your vo2 max and your cardiorespiratory fitness and therefore um, delivers this yeah a very substantial increase in fitness in this very short period of time there's um some other mechanisms uh, that lead to, to further adaptations. For example, your blood plasma volume increases. Uh, and overall, you, you get better at both delivering and utilizing oxygen. You know, uh, that, that brings to mind um, years ago when the, when the jogging craze came out, they, uh, and the marathoning craze came out, they, uh, they interviewed some Kalahari Bushmen, uh, the Ai Kung, uh, who are great long distance walkers. Mm -hmm. They think nothing about, you know, walking 20 miles, stalking game. And they asked them, you know, what, what do you think about running 26 miles? And they said, well, why would anybody do that? Um, you'd, you know, you'd waste all those calories, uh, you know, walking for 26 miles, mm -hmm. running for 26 miles to, to catch the animal. And if the animal was chasing you, he would have caught you long before that. And, and you're right, this, this me immediate power need was, you're right, fight or flight. Uh, we had to get mm -hmm. up a tree <laughs> or we had to wrestle a saber-toothed tiger, either of which would be a very short uh, bout yeah. of intense exercise. Uh, so mm -hmm. you're right. Yeah, we were we were built for this. So uh, you're 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 we have an evolutionary reason that to have this. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, another thing, how um, so the response is to the rapid onset, basically of the sprint. And one thing that. Um, if you want to call it a hack or something really clever, is that the when when you switch on the when you have this spike in energy demand, um, the body anticipates a fight or flight uh, situation and prepares for that, and it means it mobilizes lots and lots of energy, mobilizes lots and lots of glycogen. You burn only through you metabolize only a tiny fraction of that. Um, because the sprints are so short, but the the signal went in already just with the onset. And that is uh, thought to be the reason why you don't have to do more sprints or longer sprints. Um, you, you would just burn through more of that mobilized glycogen. But the, the signal was already went in at the very beginning. Um, and therefore, that triggered already the adaptation. And there's something really quite peculiar and um, quite unique about rehit, because uh, with exercise, uh, it's usually a quite linear function. If you either work longer or work harder, you get greater benefit. What, what the data right now suggests is that with rehit, doing more sprints and longer sprints, it not only does you not give 
uh, does the, it's not only that you don't get greater benefits, it's actually an inverse relationship. So if you do more sprints or longer sprints, you, you get less fitness benefits. Now, that's, that's a curiosity and a, a little bit of a paradox. It's not entirely understood. What scientists think happens is that their psychology just kicks in. So if you knew you had to do uh, 10 sprints and they're all like 40 seconds long, you just don't go all out. You don't push to your limit. You, you operate, you, you pace yourself and you, you stay somewhere at 80, 90% and it's going to be really hard and so on, but you don't get the benefits from this short, sharp spike in energy demand. Um, and with two 20 second sprints, so by the end of the, the last five seconds, you feel a bit of discomfort, uh, admittedly, but that is short enough for you to really push to your limits and therefore reap the rewards of this signal um, that's derived from this, this very sudden onset of energy demand. So how, um, so, you know, I just, I described, you know, the typical five minute um, Carol bike experience. I suppose a lot of people are saying, well, okay, you know, thank you very much, Robert. Uh, now I know what I'm supposed to do. Why can't I just hop on my exercise bike and duplicate that experience? What say you? Yeah, so uh, we, we tried it. So we, we had no intention of becoming or inventing an exercise bike. The, the science existed beforehand. As I said, there's been... Um, 15, 20 years uh, researched. When we came across it, we fell in love and we really wanted just to do that exercise. Um, and uh, I remember very well, uh, so there was a BBC documentary about that where they showcased the science of rehit, the amazing benefits, how you don't even sweat, you could do it in your suit. Uh, and I bought uh, over uh, like the, the same evening um, a very good conventional exercise bike and thought, I I'll just do it. Um, but I couldn't. The experience was nothing like what was portrayed in that documentary. And, well, we, we contacted the scientists who were featured there. It was Dr. Niels Follett, um, uh, amongst others, and asked them, what, what, what are we doing wrong? And the first thing he said was, well, you need a special bike. So... In their, in their labs, and they failed to mention that in the documentary. Oh, by the way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, in their lab, they used special equipment um, that was operated by a second person, so by a lab technician and exercise physiologist. Um, and with the, that second person, you could dial in the optimal resistance at the right time. And to get this spike in energy demand, you have to basically start pedaling really fast at low resistance, and then your personalized resistance needs to be applied in an instant at the optimal time. And that's just very, very difficult on a normal bike. Now, most people just wouldn't know what maximum intensity feels like. Uh, if you pedal at top speed, try to dial in, like turn a button, it, it's just very difficult. So. Um, so we decided, um, and, and that was really, that's a genesis of Carol bike that it's unpractical to have very expensive research equipment and a second person there. <laughs> we, we, we thought there must be a better solution to that. We, we use technology. We use a computer controlled resistance, uh, mechanism, a, a computer controlled brake that automates the workout. Um, and we use algorithms and AI to find the optimal personalized resistance for each, each user, no matter how fit or, or not you are and what age you are. And that's, that's really how it came about. So, of course, people are welcome to try it. I don't think so. We were very disappointed when we tried it on a normal bike and it was enough for us to say, hey, we, we're going we, to we're gonna build our own bike. We, we can do better than that. Um, and Carol is very optimized for these rehit ride. It's not the only thing you can do. It's in fact, it's a very versatile bike, um, but we've really tried to optimize every aspect of the bike to make it perfect for this type of workout. I actually have done it 
in my suit, uh, and I was able to do it, and mm -hmm. and I did not ruin my suit. Uh, so you're right, uh, and and you know that's actually one of the the brilliance of this uh, because in general, uh, doing exercises is. A, is number one a pain in the neck number two you you are convinced that you have to do it for a long time uh, to get any sort of benefit and you're also right that uh, the traditional hit training uh, personally speaking you know more is coming uh, and mm -hmm. i think psychologically you protect yourself because you, you really don't want to go to failure uh, mm. psychologically. Uh, yeah. yeah. And yet you guys have figured this out. So, so what you're saying is that the, the computer is always tracking my effort and knows as I get fitter to be, be the technician and, and turn up mm. the resistance. And it, so it, it tracks this. That's correct. That's correct. So in the lab setting, so it's literally plate loaded bikes. They put like some, some metal bike uh, weights um, on the, the resistance system that get released and then slow down the, the or apply a, a resistance based on that. Um, and in the lab, they have obviously developed certain like reference tables as to how much resistance should be applied. Um, but then they also applied judgment. So they looked you up and down, their subjects up and down and said, like, within that range, um, here we'll apply a bit more, here we'll apply less based on how uh, I, I assess your fitness levels to be. Now, we, we can't do that because it's, it's not supervised. We have, um, you, you do this in your own home. You can do it in, in, in like the leading gym or like biohacking facilities. But um, it's, it's not typically a supervised exercise. So for your first ride, we use similar reference tables based on what the scientific community used. And we've got by now, after hundreds of thousands, um, well, many hundreds of thousands of rides, uh, additional data. So based on everything you tell us, we, we find um, a very good estimate as to how the workout should be for you what the resistance level should be. But then we also look at your performance and how you perform during the ride, um, how quickly you fatigued during the sprints. And based on that, the resistance will be personalized and optimized from ride to ride. So not only will we find very quickly the optimal point for you at that stage, but we will also keep making it more challenging as you get fitter and stronger so that you plateau as late as possible. Or if you had um, like an injury or, or you, you had a, a pause in training or so where your fitness declined, we will also make it easier for you so that it's always a challenging but, but feasible workout to, to perform. Yeah, and I like the feature. It, it basically gives you a a graph of your mm -hmm. you know previous performance and then shows you know ho hopefully uh that oh look you know you incrementally beat your previous performance so th there is a, cleverly uh, you've designed in some feedback to uh, give me you know a gold star for my effort or exactly you can actually that, yes. or you can see that eh, and you're right the computer can tell you're you're falling off at, at the mm. end and and you and you can see that absolutely and i mean it's completely natural that you should fatigue during the sprint and in fact if you were so so that curve um of your power throughout the sprint has to drop off the otherwise you haven't reached your peak it's it's basically your peak power and peak intensity, you can only hold for literally a fraction of a second. It's, it's a momentary thing. Uh, and then you will drop, your power output will drop off. Right. And that's uh, a normal and um, intended uh, characteristic. And in fact, so after, so we've got by far, by far the largest database of rehit rides with like 25,000 riders many hundreds of thousands of rides that we can analyze. 
And so we know what the optimal shape of that curve is for any type of person and are therefore able to really dial in on the optimal resistance so that, um, yeah, you, you can push yourself to your limits and gain the maximum benefits from rehit. This must be terrible news for personal trainers out there where no pain, no gain, and you got to, you know, sweat through. Uh, I mean, you got to be on that bike. And there are, you know, there are our bike programs um, that I have done. And mm -hmm. I've, you know, hill climbed through these things and I've hill climbed on bikes through Tuscany. I don't, uh, it's hard. So you're saying, come on now, folks. You really can get a lot of benefit through these little short sessions. Yes? That's right. That's right. Absolutely. And it's not only, so, so uh, we, we have a lot of data um, on that. And we, we can see that we're, we're basically replicating the level of improvement that was seen in academic trials. But, you know, it's, uh, I, I, would, <laughs> I would argue that the um, leading um, for example, personal trainers or or like performance studios, they embrace it. Um, they're, they're different people. Some people do not like to exercise and they just want to get it done as quickly as possible. But uh, we, we have many users who really enjoy exercising and they just want um, a uh, th this really powerful stimulus as part of their program. And it's, it's an additional thing. Or, or they also, because the bike can do lots and lots of other things as well, um, use varied um, programs and mix it up. And so it's, there, there is really a great, I, I'm surprised if I see kind of how broad the spectrum of our users is from, you know, people who, who struggled to exercise and, and found it hard to find something that suits them to, um, yeah, really, I mean, top class athletes who, who just want, um, basically an additional stimulus from this very high intensity, uh, very short sprints. So it's the range is really pretty vast. All right. I mentioned in the introduction that this is a anti-aging machine, perhaps is the nice way of saying mm. that. What, how in the world do you make that claim? Because that's a very, you can de-age by 10 years. Uh, wh where does all this come from? I can, I can back that claim up. So um, with Rehit and the Carol bike, and this has been shown in numerous studies and we see it in our data, you get a substantial improvement in VO2 max. So you get around 12% in just eight weeks. And then further studies and our own data show, shows um, after um, like 18 to 20 weeks or so, you're, you're up to 20%. Um, and VO2 uh, let, max. Let me, yeah, let me back up uh, for our listeners and viewers who don't know what's a VO2 max and why should we care? Of course. Yes. So VO2 max is, um, your ability to burn, to use oxygen, uh, during exercise. And it is, uh, possibly, probably the most important health marker. Um, and there's a very strong, association or correlation, correlation between yeah. VO2 max and, and longevity. So um, and the other thing is from the age of 30, we, we lose VO2 max about 10% per decade. So in only eight weeks, you can overcompensate, you can uh, regain more than you would lose in terms of VO2 max, cardiorespiratory fitness, um, than, than, a, than a whole decade of aging. So it's, it's not subtle at all. It's very um, noticeable. You, you get the metrics on the bike, you get a fitness score, so you can track yourself um, very well um, from right to right and see your progress. But you can also feel your progress because you will feel, I mean, yeah, feeling in terms of cardio fitness 10 years younger, that's very significant. Um, the, the other thing is, uh, and this is based on scientific research, the, the correlation between VO2 max and healthy life expectancy. So um, a 10% increase in VO2 max 
um, would correspond or the correlation would be equivalent to two years of healthy life expectancy gained. So that's, that's very substantial. Um, and so if longevity, I mean, it depends what your health goals are, but most people I think would like to age well and um, uh, in good fitness. And, and improving your VO2 max is one of the best ways to achieve that. You know, it, it's interesting. Uh, I, I like to study uh, super old people uh, in, you know, and the, the term has been coined blue, blue zones. In my upcoming mm -hmm. book, I actually debunk blue zones. But uh, a great number of these places, uh, and I was a professor at Loma Linda University in Loma Linda, California for many years. And all of these areas are hilly communities. And mm -hmm. interestingly enough, uh, four out of the five groups are uh, sheep and goat herders. And uh, I've these sheep herders uh, in their 90s have incredible VO2 max. I, mm. I couldn't keep up with these sheep herders going up hills. So you're right. Uh, their VO2 max is, is really impressive. And I, and I think part of it is because they go up and down hills uh, all day long. Mm. Uh, yeah. So you're right. VO2 max is really important. So do you, have any, do you have any user examples that illustrate this? You probably have tons. We, we do, we do, and we have um, we we have a lot. Um, we, we have one. Um, I don't know whether you had the pleasure to meet Andrea. She's she was with us at at the biohacking conference. She's also a user, but an ambassador. Um, she wouldn't mind telling if I told her a story. So um, she's an avid user, and uh, her she's in her fifty, but she's got the VO two max of a. Oh, I think it was a 20 year old. I mean, unbelievable wow. um, improvements that she's achieved and where, where her cardiologist couldn't believe what, um, what values she produced. Now that's, she's quite exceptional in so many ways um, and very special. But so we know we do very clearly get the feedback from our users that it's very noticeable, very, tangible improvement that they achieve. I want to segue into something you brought up, what really prompted you to figure this bike out. And that is, uh, as, as you're well aware, and I hope our listeners are aware, in, in America, only 88% of Americans uh, are, have metabolic inflexibility. They are insulin resistant. They are pre-diabetic or diabetic, and I don't think there's a difference. Uh, so only 12% of Americans, in, in fact, only 50% of normal weight individuals are metabolically flexible, which is mm -hmm. really scary. So, and again, you got into this because you wanted to figure out a way of helping these individuals, as I do. So tell me how the Carol bike affects insulin resistance, which is one of our great killers and agers of, of mm. everything. Yeah, yeah, sure. So in terms of the um, results that we've seen in academic, randomized controlled, peer-reviewed trials, um, we've seen very impressive improvements in metabolic health. So um, one trial, and that was done with Carol Bike, um, compared to jogging, the uh, Carol Bike group after eight weeks using the bike three times a week saw an improvement in their METS Z score. So that's uh, a metabolic risk score that's, that's calculated based on a basket of um, physiological measurements like blood pressure, HDL cholesterol, triglycerides, blood sugar, waist circumference. And in only eight weeks, that risk score reduced by 62%. So it's a very remarkable um, reduction in, in, in risk of developing metabolic diseases. Now, the mechanism, and the, nothing is here entirely that um, the, the last word. It's an emerging 
field of research, even though people have been working on it for 15, 20 years. But um, what one reason to um, why, why this might be so effective is as you do those sprints, um, you you mobilize lots of glycogen, so uh, sugar stored in your muscles. Um, you empty the emergency energy reserve of your body, and your body really wants to be ready for you know the next um, um, uh, attack or the next critical situation in a way, and so wants to replenish those uh, stores also as quickly as possible. And and these processes of accessing energy and storing energy um, are governed by insulin, and therefore it is thought that that's the mechanism that improves insulin sensitivity, uh, reduces insulin resistance, and ultimately um, improves metabolic health and supports weight management. Even though, so, so uh, many people do exercise for weight management. I don't think it should be the primary goal, but I totally respect that that's, it's an important goal. I think that there's much greater prizes actually to be had than, than, just um, burning some calories, like the the metabolic health benefits are much greater, in my view, um, yes. than just burning some calories. Um, but basically overcoming insulin resistance would make it so much easier to manage your weight because you can actually, like if you do want to fast, I, I fast from time to time. Um, uh, I, I have the impression I'm because I'm metabolically flexible and, and not insulin resistant, I can actually access my fat store and the energy in my adipose tissue. And so I'm not starved, um, even though, so I like to do these um, fasting mimicking. I never do like a water fast or so, but uh, from time to time, I do these five days programs with uh, significantly reduced calorie intake. And I managed to do those with hardly any sensation of really hunger and starving. Um, and that I attribute that to metabolic flexibility and because yeah. I can actually use the the energy I carry around with me. Yeah, and, uh, you know, the study you refer to, I think people, people should understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they just had to do these Carol Bike workouts th three times per week. That's correct, yes. So yeah. it's over eight weeks, and it was done three times a week, and they spent so, so around 25 minutes working out per week. It was very, very little time investment. Man, I mean, that's a, that's a deal. And, and you're right. I, you know, I, in, in my clinics, I, I measure uh, fasting insulin and insulin resistance. So we use HOMA IR. But it's interesting, um, most people are unaware that they have an elevated fasting insulin. Even people with normal blood sugars, even people with normal hemoglobin A1Cs are shocked when they actually have an elevated insulin level and an elevated insulin resistance. And the way I, I tell people is that your, your muscles are essentially the customer that insulin sells the food that you eat to. And if, if, the, if the muscles are hungry, it's an easy sell. They're going, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And give me some of that. Uh, I, you know, it looks delicious. But if your muscles are full, then yeah. the best sales pitch in the world isn't going to mm. work because the muscles go, I'm sorry. You know, there's no room in here. I'm stuffed. You know, go away. And what happens to my patients and happened to me back when I was fat is that insulin does not want to waste calories. And so insulin says, you know, a famine will be coming. It always has. And I'm going to help you out. And I'm going to take all those extra calories that the muscles don't want. And I'm going to store it as fat. Mm. You'll thank yeah. me someday. And because mm. the, the famine is coming, it always has. Of course, it hasn't been here for quite a while. Uh, and my patients really get it. So what you're saying is, is so true. You, and it just takes a little stimulus to make your muscles hungry. Mm. Uh, and I think that's what you've proved uh, with the bike. Yeah. Speaking of weight loss, who cares about weight loss if what we're losing is muscle? And uh, one of the 
scary things from the latest weight loss drug craze um, is that the initial results, and there's still, there's still not enough studies, looks like the weight loss from these drugs, mm. 40, 44% of the weight loss is muscle. And that to me is really scary because again, muscles are the customer for insulin. And so tell me about fat loss and the Carol bike. I, I wholeheartedly agree. And I, I think people should be very careful, especially, so I'm now 46 and I'm actually, like I'm much more interested in maintaining and building muscle um, than being at my skinniest, leanest. So uh, yeah, I would much rather have slightly higher weight and good level of muscle mass than uh, lose a lot of weight at the cost of also reducing muscle mass. I entirely agree there. So um, I, I do think Carol supports weight management through the mechanisms we've discussed around insulin sensitivity. Carol also um, burns a meaningful amount of calories um, because of the afterburn, because of uh, there's something called um, excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. Um, and so uh, that means even though during the short sprints, you burn quite little uh, energy, so little that your body doesn't heat up and, and many people don't sweat. Um, research has shown that you burn through a substantial amount of calories in the next 90 minutes, 120 minutes after the sprint. And so it does contribute to like a meaningful amount of calories. Um, so for uh, I give you an example. I do a ride most mornings and um, we, we can calculate the epoch because that's been thoroughly investigated. And, and in six, seven minutes on the bike, I burn about 220 calories. Now that's compared to my overall need, um, it's almost like 10% of, my, um, of my, my daily kind of calorie uh, requirement. And that's meaningful if you, if you have that off. And um, there's other programs and the, the, there's actually, there's a little bit of a gender bias in there. So it seems to be our female users are using that program more. We call it the fat burn series which has um, done at slightly lower intensity, but has a lot more sprints and shorter sprints. So it's like uh, eight seconds on, 12 seconds off, and you, you sweat like crazy with that one. But you also burn through phenomenal amounts of calories. So if weight management was one of the, your primary goals, um, that would be a good um, program to also mix in. So we, we think everybody should do the rehit, kind of to have your base covered. But then you, you could mix in um, some of these fat burn uh, programs. Um, and that, that would certainly help with calorie consumption. The other thing is um, in rehit, because the forces are quite high, um, it is actually the, the forces are meaningful also from a strength perspective. So while you're not training your upper body, you do actually train your legs also for uh, strength and uh, so this, this hasn't been published yet, but I'm, I had sight of the results. Um, a new study that showed that you have also around, a, I think it was 12% um, improvement in strength, uh, lower body strength after after uh, eight weeks oh. doing the, these rehit rides. So it's basically you're through that training you would you would offset even if you um, you know have a calorie deficit through the training, you would protect your muscle mass. Yeah, as I, you know, my patients uh, know, and I teach them, that really 60 to 70% of our muscle mass is in our butt and our thighs. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're working. And I tell them, please, please don't go to the gym and get the five-pound weights and, and do mm -hmm. curls because... Uh, yeah, you may get guns, but you're wasting your time in terms of the real consumers. Uh, yeah. And that's your, your butt and your thigh muscles. So yeah, you're exactly right. Carol bike exercise and getting smarter. Um, 
Now, it sounds really smart to just exercise for five minutes, so I'm, I'm already smarter. Uh, but tell me about BDNF and, and the HIT series. Yeah, sure, sure. So the, the exercise, I mean, exercise in general has lots and lots of positive effects. And high-intensity exercise has in particular many positive effects and some uh, maybe that people didn't e expect. But there is actually a large body of evidence that supports that um, especially high-intensity exercise releases BDNF, that's brain-derived neurotropic factor. And that helps to keep the brain young and healthy. So it, it uh, encourages neuroplasticity. Um, and if you have lots of it, um, it's associated, correlated with higher cognitive performance, attention, memory. Uh, and if you have little of it, it's also correlated with um, cognitive impairment and, and dementia and, and even depression and things. So, so having Having an exercise that stimulates BDNF release is certainly helpful. And one recent study uh, has shown that um, these short sprints increase BDNF um, some four to five times more than light exercises for a much longer period. So that was light exercise for 90 minutes wow. um, did. Some of this is obviously black box and we're just observing and we, we don't know all the, like how it links together. But the observation seems to be that high intensity exercise um, really particular, is particularly beneficial for BDNF release. Yeah, and we're, we're learning more and more about a set of signaling molecules called myokines that are released uh, from muscles. And you know, I think the science is, is you know, is it in its infancy, but these myokines uh, definitely have some neurotropic effects that, again, we're just uncovering this, this whole class of, of signaling molecules. So, mm -hmm. yeah, another good reason to do this. All right. Well, there's certainly a growing interest in uh, the home fitness trend. Where do, you, where do you see the Carol bike standing in the next few years? Oh, so... I hope that everybody has one. So uh, our intention when we started, and I hope this doesn't sound too grand, uh, but was really to shift the needle on an epidemic of inactivity. The, the benefits of exercise are so clear and so overwhelmingly positive that it's really hard to understand why we don't do it more. And the, the figures, the participation rates and, and activity rates are really quite depressing. It's, uh, I think, in the U.S. by some measures, only five percent of the population gets sufficient um, exercise and physical activity. Um, we, we hope that time-efficient exercise can make a difference and and actually shift the needle on this epidemic of inactivity. So. Um, obviously, we want to be successful as a company, no question. But we'd also like to make a real difference to people's lives and, and help them find a habit that they can fit into their life to, to get and stay fit and active. Some people say, this is great, but I want, I want a trainer yelling at me, um, either in person or via a video, mm -hmm. to make me do this. Can the Carol bike be configured to yell at me? Or what are you doing? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yes. And the um, what, what we have done is, we, we obviously, we have our own workout series. So at the moment, there's some 20 protocols of, or workout yeah. options, all with good scientific um, evidence. But we recognize that um, people might not always want to do the same thing. Sometimes they have more time or in a household, there's several people living. So you can use the Carol app with a number of third party apps. So you, you can have the Peloton digital on it. And that works nicely. And then uh, another thing is, uh, and, and so the, the cycling community is a, quite a subculture, really. Um, they love to, uh, in winter or whenever it's raining, uh, or, or whenever, in many circumstances, work out on um, apps like Swift, um, where you can cycle 
through virtual worlds with literally thousands of people. Um, and there's a number of those apps, Swift, KinoMap. Um, and with our latest model, we are um, fully compatible with those apps. Um, so you can use a variety of third-party apps um, through to cycle through virtual worlds, through through like video recorded um, worlds. It's uh, really quite uh, amazing the variety of third-party apps that also works on Carol. So we. Um, we, we've made the bike very specialized, and this is always our primary focus. We want it to be as good as possible, uh, optimal for rehit. But we recognize that, um, you know, your, your wife, your children, uh, partner um, might, might have different tastes. And most people just don't have two bikes at home. Most people have one bike at home. Um, and so, therefore, we, we can't just be a one-trick pony and have to enable those things too. More amazing episodes just like this one. Watch now. Turns out that house chores, washing dishes, doing the laundry, sweeping the floor, vacuuming, making a bed count towards exercise.